Hello, we're back again. Got a bit of rain in the air, but covered up. So I'm going to keep outside. And it's still quite warm, so it's nice. Um, so, where were we? We are now on chapter 12, which is called Alois, Ladybird and Poet. Let's crack on. The sun was shining high above the tops of the beech trees when Maya awoke in her woodland retreat. In the first moments, the moonlight, the chirping of the cricket, the midsummer night meadow, the lovely sprite, the boy and the girl in the arbour, all seemed the perishing fancies of a delicious dream. Yet here it was, almost midday, and she remembered slipping back into her chamber in the chill of dawn. So it had all been real. She had spent the night with the flower sprite and had seen the two human beings with their arms round each other in the arbour arbor of the woodbine and jasmine. The sun outside was glowing hot on the leaves. A warm wind was stirring and Maya heard the mixed chorus of a thousand insects. Ah, oh, what she knew. Oh, what she knew. So proud was she of the great thing that had happened to her that she couldn't get out of the others fast enough. She thought they must read it in her very looks. But in the sun night, everything was the same as ever. Nothing had changed. Nothing recalled the blue moonlight night. The insects came, say, how do you do, and left. Yonder the meadow was a scene of blustering activity. The birds, the insects and the butterflies hopped, flew and flitted in the hot, flickering air around the tall midsummer flowers. Sadness fell upon Maya. There was no one in the world to share her joys and sorrows. She couldn't make up her mind to fly over and join the others in the meadows. No, she would go to the woods. The woods are serious and solemn and they suited her mood. How many mysteries and marvels lie hidden in the dim depths of the woods? No one suspects who hurries unobservant along the beaten tracks. You must bend aside the branches of the underbrush or lean down and peep between the blackberry bears through the tall grass and across the thick moss. Under the shaded leaves of the plants, in holes in the ground and the tree trunks, in the decaying bark of stumps, in the curl and twists of the roots that coil on the ground like serpents, there is an active, multiform life by day and by night. Full of joys and dangers, struggles, sorrows and pleasures. Maya divined only a little of this as she flew low between the dark brown trunks under the leafy roof of green. She followed a narrow trail of the grass which made a clear path through thicket and clearing. Now and then the sun seemed to disappear behind the clouds. So deep was the shade under the high foliage and in the close shrubbery. But soon... She was flying again through the bright shimmer of gold and green above the broad-leaved miniature forests of bracken and blackberry. After a long stretch, the woods opened their columned and overarched portals. Before Maya's eyes lay a wide field of grain in the golden sunshine. Butterfly weed flamed up on the grassy borders. She alighted on the branch of a birch tree at the end of the field and gazed upon the sea of gold that spread out endlessly in the tranquillity of the placid day. It rippled softly under the shy summer breeze which blew gently as so, as so not to disturb the peace of the lovely world. Under the birch tree, a few small brown butterflies using the butterfly weed for corners were playing Puss in the Corners, a favourite game with butterfly children. Maya watched them a while. It must be lots of fun, she thought, and the children in the hive might be taught to play it too. The cells would do the corners, but Cassandra 
I suppose, wouldn't permit it. She's so strict. Oh, now Maya again felt sad because she'd thought of home. And she was about to drift off into homesick reverie when she heard someone beside her say, Good morning. You're a beast, it seems to me. Maya turned with a start. No, she said. Decisively not. There, sitting on her leaf, was a little polished terracotta half-sphere with seven black dots on its coupler of a back. A minute black head and bright little eyes, peeping from under the dotted dome and supporting it as best as they could. Maya detected thin legs, fine as threads. In spite of its queer figure, she somehow took a great liking to the stout little fellow. He had a distant charm. May I ask who you are? I myself am Maya, the nation of bees. Do you have? Do you mean to insult me? You have no reason to. But why should I? I don't know you. I really don't. Maya was quite upset. Well, it's easy to say you don't know me. Well, I'll jog your memory count. And the little creature began to wheel round slowly. You mean I'm meant to count your dots? Yes, if you please. Seven, said Maya. Well, well. You sit, you sit, don't you know? All right then, I'll tell you. I'm called exactly according to what you counted. The scientific name of our family is, ooh, Skeptomintica. Septum is Latin for seven. Puncata is Latin for dots. Points, you see. Our common name is Ladybird. My own name is Alois. I am a poet of profession, you know, our common name, of course. Maya, afraid of hurting Alois's feelings, didn't care to say, didn't dare to say no. Oh, he said, I live by the sunshine, by the peace of the day, and by the love of mankind. But don't you eat too? said Maya, quite astonished. Of course. Plant lice, don't you? No, that would be... Ooh, that is... Is what? Is what? Not usual, said Maya shyly. Of course, of course, cried Alois, trying to raise one shoulder, but not seceding, on account of the firm set of his dome. As bourgeois, you know, of course, we only uh, do only what is usual. We poets would not get very far that way. Have you time? Yes, why, said Maya. Then I'll recite you one of my poems. Sit real still and close your eyes so that nothing distracts your attention. The poem is called Man's Finger. It's about a personal experience. Are you listening? Yes, to every word. Well then, let's start. Since you did not do me wrong, that you found me doesn't matter. You are rounded, you are long. Up above you wear a flatter, pointed, pollard sheaf or platter, which you move as swift as light, but below you're fastened tight. Well, he asked after a short pause. There were tears in his eyes and a quiver in his voice. Man's finger gripped me very hard, said Maya in some embarrassment. She knew much lovelier poems. How do you find the form? he asked, with a smile of fine melancholy. He seemed to be overwhelmed by the effect he had produced. Uh, long and round? You yourself said so in the poem. I mean the artistic form. 
the form of my verse. Oh, um, yes, I thought it was very good. It is, isn't it? He cried. What you mean to say is that Man's Finger may be ranked among the best poems you know of. And one must go way back in literature before one comes across anything like it. See, the art is that it should contain something new, which is what most poets forget. And bigness too. Don't you agree with me? Uh, certainly, said Maya. I think the firm belief you express in my importance as a poet really overwhelms me. And I thank you. But I must go now. For solitude is the poet's pride. Farewell. Farewell, echoed Maya. He really didn't know just what the little fellow had been after. Well, she thought, he knows. Perhaps he's not fully grown yet. He certainly isn't very large. She looked after him as he hastened up the branch, his wee little legs scarcely visible. He looked as though he was moving on little low rollers. Maya turned her gaze away, back to the golden field of grain over which the butterflies were playing. The field and the butterflies gave her ever so much pleasure than the poetry of Alois, ladybird and poet. So have any of you written any poems? I know a few people have been uh, creative with words um, during this time. Um, either related to what's going on or not, but just a kind of good way of kind of processing what's going on. Um, if you write any, please send them to us on our Instagram or Facebook or comment. Um, it'd be really nice to hear them. See you soon.